Hello, this is Aaron Mandel, and this is going to be the Wonders of Burgundy. Normally, when I teach this region, I always tell people that it's not that complicated. Uh, that's actually not true. It is actually very complicated. And the hardest part of it is not the wine varieties that go into it, but the AOCs. So we're going to spend some time talking about the AOCs here and trying to make this a little bit easier. Now let's look at where the region of Burgundy is located. If you look on this map, you'll see the city of Dijon in France. That is in Burgundy. And when we talk about Burgundy, if you think about it for the United States, if you think about Seattle to Portland, it's not quite where Burgundy is, but it's relatively close. Chablis is actually a little bit to the north of where Seattle is located. It's actually closer to Duluth, Minnesota. And if you go all the way down to uh, uh, Puy Fousset in uh, Burgundy, well, that's south of where Seattle is. And then we further south, we can get down to Beaujolais, which not technically part of Burgundy, but it's normally taught with Burgundy. That's still a little bit north of Portland, but it gives you a general idea of uh, the distance. Uh, we're talking about 152 miles approximately between Chablis and Beaujolais, and that is the area that we're going to be covering here. Now this map shows you uh, generally Burgundy. If you look to the middle of the map, you'll see Chablis. And you'll say, well, wait a second. I, I see Dijon here to the north of the Cote Nuit. I see Mekon. I see Beaujolais. Um, why is Chablis part of Burgundy? Uh, it really shouldn't be because Chablis, if you look at it, it's actually closer to the Loire where you see Puy Fume and Sancer than it is to Dijon. Well, the easiest explanation for our purposes is just to say that Chablis was originally part of the Duchy of Burgundy and it now is part of the Burgundy wine region. It also, uh, the wines in Chablis are made from the same varieties that you really see for white wines in the in Burgundy. So it's always remained part of Burgundy and we're just going to teach it that way without having to go into a lot of detail. So what about the grapes of Burgundy? This is the easiest part of the region. Really, um, for the most part, we're talking about white Burgundy being Chardonnay and red Burgundy being Pinot Noir. Very easy. Now there is some white Burgundy made of Alagote. And if you get down to Beaujolais, you'll be talking about wines made of Gamay. But for purposes of Burgundy itself and the Cote d'Or and Chablis, we're talking about Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Now websites will always talk about uh, Burgundy being 100% Chardonnay and 100% Pinot Noir. Not technically true. The uh, wines, they do allow a little give in those regions. If you look at the laws of Gevre Chambertin, for example, in the Cote Nuit, they allow you to make uh, the wines of Gevre Chambertin, which is a red wine, primarily of Pinot Noir. Uh, they allow a little bit of Pinot Gris, a little bit of Pinot Blanc, even a little bit of Chardonnay. And why, why is that? Well, it's because it's, it's the reality of the thing. Whenever you're growing Pinot Noir, the DNA, the genetics of Pinot Gris and Pinot Noir are just too similar. Sometimes you'll actually have a, a little bit of Pinot Gris on a Pinot Noir vine. They're just that close. And in reality, you know, when, while academically we talk about Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in Burgundy, 
The reality is that if you're a winemaker and you're in that region and you have healthy grapes, you're going to use them. So, you know, I remember seeing a picture a few years ago uh, of a um, guy in Pulini Montrachet that was clearly it showed some you know Chardonnay grapes, but it had some Pinot Gris in there, and I, and I said, um, I said, well what's the Pinot Gris doing in there? He said, you know, this is the reality of the thing. The rules allow a little bit of Pinot Gris, and if I have healthy grapes, I'm going to use them. Now, is it predominantly Chardonnay and Pelini Monarchet? Of course it is. Is it predominantly Pinot Noir and Gervais Chambertin? Of course it is. But if you get away from the academics of winemaking and you get into the reality, the rules allow a little play, and if you have healthy grapes, you're going to use them. But for our purposes, we're going to always talk about white Burgundy as being Chardonnay and red Burgundy being Pinot Noir. It's just important to know that in the real world, there's often a little bit of play. So here's where we get into the complicated part of Burgundy. We're talking about the AOCs. There are more than 80 different AOCs in Burgundy and they get a little confusing and we're going to try to make it so that you understand these AOCs and that they're not so confusing. As you can see from this pyramid they are broken down by the regional, communal, premier cru, and grand cru AOCs. The regional AOCs there are more than 20 of those for our purposes, we're not going to get into all of them. We're going to really just talk about a few of them that you most commonly see. The first one is the Bourgogne AOC. You'll see wines that say just Bourgogne. They may say Bourgogne Rouge, which is the red Bourgogne's. They may say Bourgogne Blanc, which are the white Bourgogne's. And Again, the reds are going to be primarily Pinot Noir, the whites are going to be primarily Chardonnay. They may even have the variety on the label, which for these varieties, these, this regional uh, Bourgogne, they're allowed to. There are some smaller regional AOCs, such as uh, Bourgogne Haute Cote Nui, or Bourgogne Haute de Bonne. And these, of course, will come from the Côte de Nui or the Côte de Bonne. You may have some that are Côte de Chardonnay. You may have some that just say Mekong. These are regional, but they're in the smaller sub-regions of Burgundy. And then you may have the Cremant de Bourgogne. Cremant de Bourgogne is a sparkling wine made in the traditional method in Burgundy. And again, this is primarily going to be made out of Chardonnay or Burgundy. Uh, I'm sorry, Chardonnay or Pinot Noir. And it's going to be a sparkling wine. Now, if you think about uh, Champagne, Champagne is made primarily with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And here you have a Cremant a sparkling wine made in the Burgundy region instead of in Champagne that is made with the same grapes. Now in Champagne, the greatest grapes that you have are going to be made into, Chard uh, into Champagne. In Burgundy, the greatest grapes that you have are probably not going to be made in Cremant. They're going to be made into a white or red Burgundy. But that does not mean that Cremant is made with bad grapes. Cremant de Bourgogne can be a very, very good wine. Now we get into the communal AOCs, uh, the villages. And you have a lot of different villages in Burgundy. In fact, there are 44 different villages in Burgundy. And what makes it more confusing is that some of these villages, many, many years ago, decided that, well, you know, we want to sell our wines but people really know the Grand Cru vineyards. So what we'll do is we'll attach the Grand Cru vineyards to our name 
And that will make people think of those Grand Cru vineyards when they see our names on the label. So, the village of Chevrolet attached the most famous vineyard in its area, Chambertin, to its name to become Chevrolet Chambertin. Pulini attached the most famous vineyard in its region, Montrachet, to its name, Pulini Montrachet. To make things more confusing is that sometimes you had two villages that shared a famous vineyard, so they both attached the same uh, vineyard to their name. So you have Chazonia Montrachet, which is, again, attaching the Montrachet vineyard to its name. So when you're looking at Burgundy wines, you'll see Chazonia Montrachet and you'll think, oh, Montrachet, that's the famous vineyard, but it's not, the wines are not from the Grand Cru Vineyard Montrachet. They're from the village Chazon Montrachet. It doesn't mean the wines are not very good, but they are not that Grand Cru level. They're the village level. And that adds to some of the confusion. Now, when you're dealing with Premier Cru Burgundy, we're dealing with excellent vineyards that are located in some of these villages. And these are not Grand Cru level villages, although sometimes the wines are as good or better than some of the Grand Crus that are located nearby. And there are hundreds of these Premier Cru vineyards that are located in Burgundy. And what you'll do is you'll, you'll see a bottle that says um, Chazonia Montrachet and it'll list a Premier Cru vineyard. It may just say Premier Cru, in which case it's a blend of several Premier Cru vineyards in that village. Uh, or it may, it may say, instead of Premier Cru, it may say 1ER Cru. And that is telling you this is a Premier Cru wine from that village. And like I said, they'll list the vineyard typically with, with that wine. And the different Premier Cru vineyards have different reputations. They're all very good. They're all theoretically better than the Village wines. And they're all theoretically not as good as the Grand Cru vineyards. Not always the case. It depends upon the producer. And sometimes it depends upon where in that vineyard the wines are coming from. Now the final classification is Grand Cru. There are 33 Grand Cru vineyards in Burgundy. And these are all famous vineyards, such as Chambertin or Montrachet. Now, apparently they decided that it wasn't confusing enough to have 33 Grand Cru vineyards. One of those Grand Crus is Chablis. But Chablis has seven Clamats. Um, these seven Clamats are seven Grand Cru vineyards in Chablis. Not all the wines in Chablis are Grand Cru. They have 40 Premier Cru vineyards. But they have these seven Grand Cru vineyards that are technically classified as one Chablis Grand Cru. You can see why the AOCs in Burgundy are confusing. So you have these seven Clamats that are technically one Grand Cru, but these seven Grand Cru Clamats are all Grand Cru vineyards, but again, one Grand Cru for Chablis. So as you go through Burgundy, you have these Grand Cru vineyards. These Grand Cru vineyards may not say Grand Cru when they're bottled up. Um, it may it Typically, when you're in the market and you see a Burgundy that's from a Grand Cru vineyard, it does say Grand Cru. It does make it easy. Um, but they don't have to. And occasionally, you'll see something just says Chambertin, and you have to know that's a Grand Cru vineyard. Um, 99% of the time, it will say Grand Cru Chambertin.
Now, as you can see from this slide, we're talking about the amount of wine that's made in the different AOCs. 40% of the production from Burgundy is going to be regional. And of that region, you know, of the wines that are made in Burgundy, we always think about Burgundy in the United States as being a red wine. And that's because when many of us were growing up, a Taylor wine and Gallo would have Burgundy wines, a hearty Burgundy, and they were always the reds. And of course, those wines were not made in Burgundy. They were just red blends that were made in the United States. But that was the imprint that we had on our minds was that Burgundy was a red wine. Uh, actually, about 62% of the wines coming out of Burgundy are, are white. Uh, t only 29% of them are red. Uh, there's 8% that is that Cremant, the sparkling wine. And then a small percentage rosé. You, you don't really see too much of that in the U.S. market. You, you'll see some, but with 1% production, you can imagine that not much of it's going to make it to the United States. But you can see here, over 40% of the production is the regional wines. 36% is the Village. 18% uh, is the Premier Cru, and only 5% and that might even be high because I've seen some that say 2% uh, of the production is the Grand Cru. The Grand Cru wines are often very expensive. I mean, I can give you an idea here. The regional wines you can sometimes find for $10 a bottle or less. Uh, the Village can really range. I've seen Polini Monarche Village wines from very good producers such as La Flav going for um, you know, $70. Uh, but they're often much less. You're often going to find them at the $20 range. Premier Cru, you can find that really all over the gamut. Uh, $30, $40, $50. But again, from a really good producer, uh, if you get somebody like the Marquis d'Andreville out of Volnay or you get La Flave, you can be dealing with a wine that is several hundred dollars from a Premier Cru vineyard. And Grand Cru, <laughs> you can find a Grand Cru Chablis, you know, for $50, $60. But if you want something from La Flav for a Grand Cru, or you want Romani Conti, you can be dealing, we're, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of dollars for a bottle of wine, even thousands of dollars for a bottle of wine. And some of them are exceptional, and some of them aren't. Uh, so this is one of these regions where if you're going to be buying a Grand Cru and you're going to be putting that kind of money into it, it's really important that you understand who the producers are. Now we're going to talk about the producers. As you can see from the AOCs, the way the wines are uh, looked at in Burgundy is based upon the vineyard. It's not like Bordeaux where you're looking at the chateaus. Now the Napoleonic Code required that if you owned a vineyard or you owned property in France, when you passed away, the property went to all of your children. So let's say that I had owned Chambertine, and I had five children. When I passed away, each of my five children would get a portion of Chambertine. And then each of them, when they passed away, each of their children would get a section of their portion of Chambertine. So as you could see, over generations, this one vineyard is going to be broken down into very small sections. And if you only have a row of vines in a vineyard, it's kind of difficult for you to really bottle wine. So what these people, what these growers used to do, would they would sell them to an individual who would accumulate all these grapes from these different growers, make a wine, and sell it under their own label. And those people were called negotiants, the people that took these grapes and bottled them under their own label. Now the negotiants also 
would buy wine from people who were able to make their wine, but really they didn't have the ability to bottle it themselves or to find a market to sell it themselves. You got to remember that we're talking about hundreds of years ago when some of these some of these businesses started. And it wasn't easy to bottle it yourself and finding a market for them to go to the different cities and find a market that was sometimes impossible. So if you were able to make your wine and sell it to somebody who would do it, you know, you had somebody that you could get a regular income from. And so the negotiants also did that. They would buy grapes from people and make their own wine, or they would buy somebody else's wine and bottle it. And it was always bottled under their own name. And there are still negotiants, and that is what they do. They buy grapes from people and make their own wine, or they buy somebody else's wine and bottle it under their name. And I've listed here some of those that are negotiants that you should be able to find in the United States, and that I think that if you buy a wine from them, you're gonna generally be pretty happy with what they make. And not all of them are old line negotiants. Olivier Laflave, um, he's part of the Laflave family, and he said, you know, I wanna make more than what my family makes. I wanna explore different regions, make different wines. And he went out and he, you know, has, purchase grapes, you know, he has contracts with some of the growers in order to purchase their grapes and makes wines from some of the, uh, some of the other regions, but sells them under his name as a negotiant. Now we, I also list here some of the producers and these are just examples of some producers. Um, there are of course more negotiants than I list here. There are more producers of course than I list here. These are some examples and these are some because this is my PowerPoint, I listed some producers that I'm pretty happy with. And that I think that if you try their wines, you'll be very happy with. Some of them are very pricey. Um, if you can find a Tomane La Flav, it's gonna cost you. But Anne Claude La Flav, you know, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, was to me one of the greatest winemakers in the world. So if you can find one of her wines, you really, and if you can afford it, you should really try it. Uh, the same thing goes with uh, Dovisa and uh, Raveneau in uh, Chablis. My, my God, if you can find a Raveneau and try it, that's well worth your time. I, I list Marquis de Angerville because they were one of the first to start bottling their own wine. Uh, they had been selling their wines to negotiants and were not happy with some of the blending and marketing that was going on and said, well, we're gonna bottle it ourselves and we're gonna go out and we're gonna find a market and sell it ourselves. And they make great wines out of Volnay. And then I listed Tolobo because, you know, as I've mentioned several times, these Grand Cru wines are very expensive. Tolobo makes a Grand Cru Corton, which is expensive but you can get it for you know $120 probably, which is still extraordinarily expensive, but much less than these five, six, seven hundred dollar wines, or you know, if you're gonna talk about Romani Conti, thousands of dollars. And so you can get an opportunity to try a Grand Cru Burgundy from Corton without spending you know your life savings. Um, it's still gonna be expensive, but it's one of those that's more affordable. And it's also true with the Chablis. If you want to try a Grand Cru Chablis, you can try some for less than you're going to spend in Chazanne Monarche or Polini Monarche. Um, Chablis is actually, I would not say it's a bargain because it's still going to cost you a lot of money, but you can find Grand Cru Chablis not from Dovisa or Rebino, unfortunately, but you can find Grand Cru Chablis for, you know, 50, 60, 70 dollars, which is comparatively more affordable than some of the other regions. So we'll start now talking about the different regions and we're gonna start with Chablis. It's the furthest to the north. As indicated, it's actually closer to the Loire than it is to uh, Burgundy. 
Chablis is really white wine. Uh, you're talking about Chardonnay here, and it's further to the north, it's cooler, it tends to have greater acidity, the flavor tends to have more stony minerality than it does to the south. You see less use of new oak in Chablis than you do when you get down to uh, the areas to the south. But the wines in Chablis are truly outstanding. There's a, region, there's a reason that Chablis is uh, so well known for its wines. The uh, area here, as I said, um, they wanted to be confusing. So we have here the one Grand Cru with the seven Clamats. The wines that you'll mostly find in the United States, you're gonna find Le Clos a lot. You'll find some Blanchot. But you can usually find wines from all these, but the Le Clos and the Blanchot seem to be a little bit more common. These are all excellent wines. Now, uh, some people talk about um, them not doing malolactic fermentation in Chablis. They do. Um, malolactic fermentation, if you're not aware, um, one of the primary acids in wine is malic acid. Malic acid is the acid you find in green apples. As you can remember, that's a kind of a sour. Malolactic fermentation is a natural process. Uh, they can make it start, and they normally do, by adding a lactic bacteria, which converts this malic acid to lactic acid. Lactic acid is the acid in milk. Uh, if you think about the acid in milk, you think, what la what acid? Um, but that's exactly it. It's a softer acid than malic acid. So uh, malic to lactic acid is a little softer. They do that in Chablis. If you taste a wine from Chablis, you'll pick up a little bit maybe of a yogurty characteristic, um, also a little creaminess. That's going to be from the malic metallactic fermentation as well as some time on the lees. The, um, the, the reason that you don't really pick up that real butteriness that you do sometimes with metallactic fermentation is because the, there's a reaction with the uh, chemicals when you do metallactic fermentation and the new oak that helps enhance the characteristics of the malolactic fermentation when you use new oak. So if you're not using new oak, like, and they don't use it as often in Chablis, you end up with less noticeable um, malolactic fermentation notes. You don't get as much butteriness. Also, there are things you can do during the winemaking process that will help decrease the level of diacetyl, which is what's giving it that butteriness. And so you're not going to see it as much in Chablis as you will in some other regions. Now one thing I often do with Chablis, because it is a little less expensive than some of the other regions, and this is a fun little experiment you can do, is that you can get a uh, wine from Buteau, which is a Premier Cru in Chablis. Uh, Domaine Servan uh, has one that is aged in stainless steel, so has no oak characteristic at all. Or And you can get another one from Patrick Puse, P-I-U-Z-E. Uh, they use uh, old oak for their uh, Chablis in that particular vineyard. And you can taste the Domain Servan, which has the stainless steel, and you can taste the um, Patrick Puse, which has the old oak. And you can actually taste the difference that the old oak makes and the wood phenolics and how they're added to the wine. It's just a fun little experiment. And because it's Chablis and it's a premier crew, it's not cheap, but it is an interesting experiment you can engage in. Now to the south of Chablis, we get to the main area of Burgundy, the Cote d'Or. And the first region we reach is the Cote de Nuit. Now the Cote de Nuit has some of the most famous red wine regions in the world. 
and you can see them here. Uh, we start with Marcinet, which originally uh, was primarily rosés and still makes some darn good rosés, but now is a red wine region, makes some good red wines, and they're reasonably priced, so you can actually go and afford a Marcinet. They don't have any Grand Cru vineyards in Marcinet, but again, that doesn't mean that they don't make some good wines. You have Fizon, Gervais Chambertin, Maurice Saint Denis, and we move down, we continue to the south, uh, Chambon, Musigny, uh, Bougeau, Von Romany, and Nuit Saint George. One thing you should know about the Cote de Nuit is that there is only one Grand Cru for white wine in the Cote de Nuit. All the rest of the Grand Crus in the Cote de Nuit are for red wine. This doesn't mean they don't make white wine in the Cote de Nuit. They do. But there's only one Grand Cru in the Cote de Nuit for white wine, and that that Grand Cru is a Musigny, which is down here, by, uh, down by the Chambon. The red wines that you get in the Cote de Nuit are very different um, depending upon what area you're in. People talk about uh, about um, terroir. Burgundy is a great example of terroir. This area has a lot of southeast facing and southwest facing vineyards and the way that they twist and turn determines how much sunlight the grapes get and how much heat they get and make some and then there's different soil characteristics and they make great differences in the kind of wines that each region presents. Gevray Chambertin and Nuit Saint George, if you taste those wines, they are uh, bigger, they're more earthy, they are a little bit more tannic. You go down to Chambol and they're much more delicate and more uh, finessed, completely different style, even though they're all Pinot Noir. And they're all great wines, the, just that the styles are very different. Um, so that you're able to taste these wines and go through the regions. And if you're exceptionally good, you can say, or at least get a good idea about where these wines come from based upon the characteristics that they're showing in the glass. Now next we move down to the Cote de Bone. Now the Cote de Bone is you know, just to the south of the Nuit but it's somewhat the opposite with respect to the wines that you think of because the Cote de Bone has only one red Grand Cru and the rest of the Grand Cru's in the Cote de Bone are for white wine. Remember that the Cote de Nuit, you had one white wine Grand Cru and the rest were red wine Grand Cru's. So here we have one red wine Grand Cru in Corton and the rest are all white wine Grand Cru's. And as with the Nuit, that doesn't mean they're not making red wine in the Cote de Bone. In fact, some of the finest red wines in the world are made in the Cote de Bone. It's just that you don't have the Grand Cru in the Cote de Bone for the red wines other than Corton. And Corton is interesting because Corton is a red wine Grand Cru. Corton Charlemagne is a white wine Grand Cru. So you have both in Alwa Corton, it's just that the Corton is red, Corton Charlemagne is white. Now, as I indicated, there are some great red wines made in the Cote de Bone. You have Volnay, you have Pomard, both of which are world-renowned red wines. They're not Grand Cru, but they are excellent red wines. You also have some of the finest white wines made, of course, in Bone. You have Corton Charlemagne, you have Merceau, you have Chazonia Monarche, and you have Poligny Monarche. Uh, the Monarches are some of the finest. They're um, great Grand Cru wines. Merceau, if you don't have the money to be buying the Grand Cru Monarches, which most people don't, Merceau makes some great, great wines that are not Grand Cru but their Premier Cru wines are outstanding, their Village wines can be outstanding, 
So Merceau is kind of like a cheaper version. Um, Pellini Montrachet and Chardonnay Montrachet also have their Village and Premier, Premier Cru wines. Again, some great and outstanding wines that are made in those regions. And these wines, again, the whites are all going to be Chardonnay. Um, and they're just vastly different than what you get in Chablis. You're a little bit further to the south, it's a little bit warmer, the grapes are ripening a little bit more. Uh, you're not getting as much of the minerality, you're going to get some. There's going to be a little bit more ripe fruit in the wines. Merceau, Pellini Montrachet, Chazani Montrachet, Ch uh, Corton Charlemagne, they're going to use some new, new oak. Um, when I taste a Merceau, in fact the uh, new oak is one of the things I always note. Um, it's something that to me is, you know, it's a little bit more present in the Merceau than some of the other regions. Uh, they also, of course, do more, they, they also, of course, do, I shouldn't say more, but they do the um, malolactic fermentation, and because they're doing the new, new oak, you're getting that combination, so you're getting a little bit more butteriness. Um, not a tremendous amount, it's not like you get um, out of Napa where there are, is a lot more butteriness to the wines, but it, there is some of that yogurt and butteriness that you're going to note in these wines. Um, you're going to also find that um, to a lesser extent, I find in Pellini Monarchy and Chersani Monarchy, which are more delicate, more refined, maybe them or so, but also a little bit or a lot more expensive. To the south of the bone, we get into the Cote Chalonnet. And this is where you're going to find some of your bargains. This is also where you're going to find the Alagote grape, which makes a nice white wine. Uh, if you look at the village of Bougeron, uh, it's really kind of noted for its Alagote. Um, and that is what you're going to find mostly coming out of that region. Rui. R-U-L-O-Y makes some very nice uh, Chardonnay, Mercury makes some very nice Pinot Noir. Yeah, there's just some very nice wines being made here. Uh, Givray makes some good Pinot Noir. Montagne uh, also makes some good white wines. These are more inexpensive wines than you're going to find from the Bone or the Nui. Uh, there's still some very good wines that are being made in the area and because this area of Burgundy is not as well known the wines are, are just cheaper but it doesn't mean that you can't get some just excellent wines out of the region and then we get to the Maconay. Uh, Maconay again makes some very good wines some of the best wines are going to be made in Saint Veron and, of course, Puy Fousse. Puy Fousse is uh, often confused with Puy Fumé, which is in the Loire. Uh, Puy Fumé makes Sauvignon Blanc. Puy Fousse makes Chardonnay. And Puy Fousse has an, it's kind of like an amphitheater, um, the way that the this, the vineyard is naturally created. So the sun really gets in there and really ripens up that Chardonnay. And that's why the Maconnet and Puy Fousse, this region has such a reputation for its, for its white wines. Most of the wines that you see labeled from the Maconnet are gonna be white wines. They do make some red wines, um, often using the Gamay grape but really what you're gonna see here out of the Maconnet are gonna be white wines. And these are again, like the Chalonnet, these are some good bargain white wines coming out of Burgundy. They're a little bit riper in the Maconnet than you might get out of the Chalonnet, but these are some fine wines. Uh, a lot of people that think about Burgundy, if they're not thinking about the, the old Gallo versions of them, they're thinking about the expense that they have to do pay to get a decent Burgundy. And the Chalonnet and the Maconnet, you know, really, if you're 
introducing yourself to Burgundy, these are a good place to introduce yourself because they're making some very good wines that aren't going to break you. And it's, it's a way to try uh, Burgundy Pinot Noir uh, up in the Chalonnais or, Char or Chardonnays in the Chalonnais or in the Mackinac that are going to really open your eyes to this region and give you an idea about how some of these wines can be made uh, in Burgundy without uh, breaking the bank. Finally, we're going to talk about Beaujolais. Um, Beaujolais is actually in the Rhone department, but it's always taught as part of Burgundy, and it gets a bad rap. People think of Beaujolais as being uh, a wine that is, you know, comes out in November with the Beaujolais Nouveau, and then dies for the rest of the year. It's kind of the wine world's version of Santa Claus. Every November 17th, Beaujolais Nouveau comes down the chimney and presents us with a whole bunch of Beaujolais Nouveau, and then it disappears for the rest of the year. It, it, Beaujolais Nouveau is not Beaujolais. Uh, Beaujolais makes some outstanding wines. Uh, generally, I mean, you're looking at the Village wines, but if you look at the Cru Beaujolais, you're going to get some outstanding outstanding wines and they're made with the Gamay grape rather than Pinot Noir with the, within the rest of Burgundy. In Beaujolais we're dealing with Gamay and I often, I often think of the uh, Cru Beaujolais being uh, Pinot Noir light. They are earthy, they are fruity, um, they don't have the heft I guess you would say of the uh, Pinots from Burgundy to the extent that those actually have any heft, but they are very lovely wines. If you get them from Moulin Avent or Morgan or Fleury, I mean, these are going to be some very nice wines. And again, these are not even the best Cru Beaujolais are not going to break you. You can get a Cote de Pie which um, has an, an unusual name, but that's from Morgon, and these are going to be some of the finest wines, and they're going to be $22, $23 for a very nice Cru Beaujolais that I think you'll really, really enjoy. Well, thank you very much. I hope you've learned a little bit about Burgundy and the wines of Burgundy. If you are interested in doing any tastings, uh, you can find American Wine Society chapters in most states in the country. Uh, you can go to the AmericanWineSociety.org webpage and look for a chapter in your region, or you can contact the American Wine Society either by email or by uh, giving them a call, and we'll always be happy to direct you to an American Wine Society chapter in your area. If you have any questions regarding this slide, you can leave them down in the comments section. You can also email me at director education, that is director education, there's no of in there, but just director education at AmericanWineSociety.org and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Enjoy trying Burgundy. And Please just don't try to drink too much. <laughs>